Good morning and welcome to our look at the or walk through the lectionary here for this the 18th Sunday after Pentecost and we're taking a look at the epistle reading today from James chapter 5. <clears throat> and again just continuing with with our read through of, of this this letter from from James um, as he not only unfolds you know the problem of our double mindedness as we've heard over the last little bit which shows up in the way in which we show partiality but now this time around he zeroes in on on the whole question of suffering um and and what do we do during our suffering that becomes an interesting question so as we open let's begin with that word of prayer Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you that in the midst of where we are in our lives, even in our world and our society here today, we recognize more and more that mental health concerns are our big concerns, as well as, well, even the craziness that happens through politics around the world, even within our own country. Guide us by your word and your spirit as we listen to, to James um, as he explains um, and reminds us that in the midst of our suffering, in the midst of our crazy world, that you sent your son to be our savior, so that as we wrestle with all of those things that you know, wreak havoc with us on the inside and on the outside, that we are called really by faith, by your Holy Spirit, to turn our attention back to that source of our salvation in Jesus Christ. All these things we pray in the name of your son, our savior. Amen. All right, as we listen, um, you know, suffering is one of those things that is, is, you know, common to everybody. And sometimes when we're going through something where we're feeling, you know, worn down because of anxiety or fear or physical suffering or, you know, emotional financial suffering, it's very easy for us to get tricked into the idea that thinking that we are the only ones ever going through this and that, you know, nobody else can understand. And, and true, there's a unique element to each and every one of our, our situations where, you know, the, the character of, of how we wrestle with, with um, challenging situations in life um, is, is, has its unique elements. That's true. I'm not going to diminish that. But... Um, it, it's a, a wonderful and, and interesting thing to realize that because of the brokenness of sin in the world, suffering is, a uh, good big word, ubiquitous, meaning and it's everywhere. Everyone wrestles with it in their own individual kind of a way. And <clears throat> as a result, you know, as we listen to that and as we consider that, um, it becomes not just a mental health concern, but in a much deeper sense, a, a spiritual concern, which... The way, um, you know, James here, the way he puts it, it's rooted in the way in which our, our um, sin has broken our lives and unbalanced our lives so that we live with that problem of being duplicitous, double-minded, um, where we've got that war raging within us. And Paul basically talks about the same thing in his own kind of a way. And yes, when he's reflecting on the things that he ought to do and he doesn't do and all those sorts of things, and who will rescue me from this body of death, the way Paul puts it is, well, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And this whole sense of humbling ourselves that James talks about is really no different from what, uh, what Paul is referencing, where it's putting off the old Adam, the old sinful self, in order to be clothed in Christ, which is that gift that comes through, yes, the Word, and in baptism, and in the Holy Supper of our Lord, where we continue to be clothed, even though we continue to stumble. So that as we listen to this particular passage, um, it, it becomes an important one. How are we dealing with um, the stressors in our lives, whatever source they might be coming from? And, and you know, recognizing often that, that even within our own selves, it, it's not even so much what's going on outside of us as the way in which we meet it. Um, are, are we meeting it within that, with, with that strong tension inside of ourselves so that the way we interact with it, are we simply increasing our suffering by doing that? Or are we, you know, um, allowing the Holy Spirit to do his, his work to draw us back and to rest in Christ? So as we begin, you know, Paul, or Paul, James begins with that question, is any among you suffering? And certainly there is that sense of, of um, healing that comes through this, um, where which it's been adopted with the practice of anointing with oil and the way in which, well, the, the Catholic and Orthodox churches and sometimes even Anglicans will refer to it as a separate sacrament. 
Um, the reason we as Lutherans don't refer to it as a sacrament is because while well, Jesus doesn't talk about um, anointing with oil as as a separate means of, of, of grace. Um, so it's talked about in James, so it's not instituted by Christ. But the other side is, is that really, as we listen to this, um, as, it, as it unfolds here in James, it really goes back to, um, you know, addressing human suffering with the, the gift of God's grace. And as a result, the grace itself really harkens back to Jesus' word, the ministry of the word, absolution, forgiveness, um, you know, baptism, Holy Communion, and as the use of oil here, well, it becomes, it becomes an extension of that, but um, as Lutherans, we tend to view this as a, a way of symbolizing the gift of the Holy Spirit, but not necessarily as an independent um, sacrament in and of itself. So, as we, as we dig into this passage, is anyone among you suffering? And as we look at that, it becomes one of those interesting questions for us to wrestle with. I know nowadays that it's not popular um, among some circles and some generations to admit that we wrestle and struggle with suffering. Um, we prefer to put on a good face um, and not, not admit that those things are going on. But right here in Scripture, there is always that, um, that, 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 real understanding of our broken human condition and that invitation to to be open about it before the Lord and open about it before the ministers of the church, open about it before the community of the church so that as we as we navigate this brokenness in our lives, um, that we always do so together pointing to Christ, who is the one who addresses that suffering by becoming the one who suffers for us on the cross. So is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Okay, so if you're suffering, don't simply run with what's going on. Pray, turn back to God, turn back your attention back to Christ. Is anyone cheerful? Okay, flipping it around. Let him sing praise. Don't forget to do that when you're cheerful. It's very easy when we're in either um, a mood where we're high on our, our positive emotions or where we are and I'll use the phrase drunk on our negative emotions because what happens with our negative emotions is that we react very quickly um, and then we end up um, running with how we react. It's like a fight, flight, freeze response so that afterwards, we, we get, you know, our, our brain, our frontal lobe doesn't kick in right away and then along the way we don't realize how the the reaction and the adrenaline and the anxiety you know um hormones within our body are really driving this as a fight flight freeze response and then we end up living on that and 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 then weaving our our thinking around what we're doing as as you know as as a good response or as a bad response or and then we fight that and it turns into this other argument no james is saying whether you're you know, happy or drunk with, with a stressful response during suffering, turn your attention back to Christ. So anchor yourself in that gift um, where we have been given that peace that passes all understanding. So is anyone among you sick? And here's where we go the next step. So relating to physical illness. And physical illness can become a source of suffering along the way as well. And he says, let him call the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. It was the Lord, Jesus Christ, obviously. But here's one of the things that we often trip over in our English translations and some denominations build on this and run in strange kind of ways. Um, the word elder, as it's used in the New Testament, doesn't refer to um, the way that we use the term elder within our churches today, um, where it refers to you know, these elected lay individuals who assist. That all came in in the middle of the 1900s with the the Abdon model of church constitutions. And, you know, the sense of elder all of a sudden becomes this this um, kind of a, a lay position within the, within the context of the church. In the New Testament, the term elder is presbyter, which is, um, refer and Paul refers to himself as a presbyter, and, and so do the other apostles. Um, John does within his letters. And so as we hear that word, really the term elder refers to one of the, one of the clergy within the life of the congregation. Um, so as we hear that word, 
um, right here, and that's actually where we get the, and, and still used as a reference to to um, clergy in some some languages, like the Greek language, um, presbyter, or the way that it came into um, the, the the Western languages, moving from from the Greek context and the Latin, and then over into the English context. If you look it up in the Oxford English Dictionary. Um, you follow you follow the development of that term. Um, the word priest actually goes back to presbyter, and, and the way that it develops is as presbyter gets shortened along the way throughout history into prebst, for shortened form of presbyteros, um, prebst, and then because bst becomes a, a an awkward kind of a consonant sort of a combination to pronounce. Um, the B gets dropped, and so it turns into prest, and then eventually in the English context, at least, prest, um, and, and this is what, you know, scholars of the development of the English language will talk about. There's a vowel shift that happens a number of times in the development of the English language from Old English to Middle English and then into Modern English. Well, it prest, the E becomes priest, priest, priest. Um, so priest as a word in reference to the clergy has nothing to do with Old Testament priesthood, although that's usually where our minds run. Um, priest has to do with going back to the New Testament term presbyter, presbyteros, prepst. Um, here as James is saying this, okay, suffering, if you're cheerful, turn your attention back to God. Don't lose sight of your spiritual roots. Don't let the, the strong emotions drive you into this oblivious sort of existence where we build on ourselves and lose that connection with Christ, um, which unfortunately has become the, you know, so much a part of the way in which modern culture runs where, where um, it's like, I'm doing good, I don't need God. You know, or you know, God's just there to pat me on the head as the sugar daddy in heaven who gives me anything that I want and all these sorts of things. And then all of a sudden when life isn't going well, we're shaken to our knees. What's the matter, God? Don't you love me anymore? Um, no, in the midst of both our suffering and cheerful times, even in the midst of sickness, um, God's gift of Christ is there for us. And the work of the Holy Spirit is always to draw us back. So here, is anyone among you sick? Let him call the elders, the clergy of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And so this is something that, you know, is part of the pastoral care ministry. The use of oil, too, um, and what we do know is, is that oil was used as a medicine um, in, in the early years and uh, continues with the essential oils movement here in our world today, where... I'm um, recognizing that some herbal products do have very real, you know, um, real applications in terms of being antiseptic and all these kinds of things. Um, basically, they were joined with oil, and we find that in the New Testament. But the use of oil also has um, another association within the Greek language. So unfolding all these fun things. Um, oil is a lion in Greek. That's the term in the Greek language. The word for mercy is eleison, and because of the way in which those two words, even though they're not directly related, they sound similar, um, there's always this play on words which shows up not only the way we see it here, or um, the way in which, you know, the, 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 the virgins with the oil, the virgins without the oil, all these sorts of things, um, eleison, eleison, the ones with mercy and the ones without mercy, and then also in the way in which it's attached with the working of the Holy Spirit later on within the way in which, you know, the, the bigger New Testament worldview um, uh, it comes together. Basically, oil becomes a symbol of God's grace and God's mercy and, it's, and, and, and God's healing, the healing aspect of God's mercy and God's grace. So here, let him anoint him with oil in the name of what's being added to it, not an herbal substance, but the name of our Lord. And the prayer of faith okay, will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. So here, as we're looking at this, the prayer of faith is turning our attention back to Christ, back to the Lord, back to the great physician, 
back to um, the, the greatest servant of all, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died for us and stepped into our suffering to the point of suffering, to the point of death on the cross. So here, um, the prayer of faith and the promise of the resurrection. Grace, mercy, and promise of resurrection. That pursuit of forgiveness in Christ and healing through that same gift in Christ. Okay, and we find that connection in the very next line. And so the Lord will raise him up, and if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Again, back to that, that, that point that so often... Um, Many movements on, you know, evangelical Christianity will talk about forgiveness but not apply it. Because forgiveness, um, you know, they have this idea that forgiveness is not something that you can actually proclaim in church. You just point to Jesus who forgives. When Jesus is the one who said, sent out the disciples, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven them. Whoever sins you retain, they are retained. Or, end of Luke, go and preach you know, uh, repentance and forgiveness in Jesus' name, all these kinds of things. And then, then Matthew, in, in case you want to twist Luke's way of putting it into saying you just point to Jesus, again, Matthew talks about how Jesus, you know, gives the keys of the kingdom to heaven. And what does a key do? It locks and unlocks. And what is that key? Well, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Um, so forgiveness, that ministry of forgiveness. So we hear this. Um, as a result, this anointing with oil basically is simply an extension of that ministry of forgiveness as it's applied in a therapeutic kind of a context in order to address um, suffering um, and sickness within our lives. And we often forget that because here in our modern day, we've artificially divided um, health and uh, physical health and spiritual health from one another when um, throughout the New Testament and throughout the Middle Ages and throughout most cultures of the world, those two are very closely tied together. And it's only recently that people are starting to talk about spirituality in relationship to health. But again, they talk about spirituality as based in interiority rather than in this bigger um, holistic sense as it relates to our connection with Christ. Okay, all these kinds of things. Lots of stuff going on in our culture that, that basically runs roughshod over the understanding that comes here from Scripture. So therefore, verse 16, um, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. What? You mean confession is not just me thinking about it, me bad, and then I beat myself up and then I go? No, it isn't. Um, confession involves that, that um, confessing of our sins, which is why we practice it with the prayer of confession in church, where it becomes, um, that prayer becomes not just the thing that you jumble through to get to the next part of the service, even though so often we treat it that way. Um, it, it's a good prayer to take a look at and pay attention to each line and each phrase as we go through it, because um, instead of confessing specific sins, it's true, it doesn't do that. It provides the framework for us to look at ourselves in order to say, you know what, I've sinned in thought, word, and deed. And then as the Holy Spirit brings those elements, how have I sinned in thought? How have I sinned in word? How have I sinned in deed? By what I've done and by what I've left undone. All these kinds of things. Um, it becomes an important prayer to, to structure how we take a look at our lives of confession. Before the Lord and before one another. Yes, um, I have to chuckle. This week, um, one of our ran into one of our members that doesn't attend very often, and it's not to pick on pick on you. So if you're watching this, don't don't take it personally. But at the same time, here's here's this thing. There's this uh, cultural idea. Well, why why go to church when I can go directly to the source? Well, here's the thing. Because the Holy Spirit and the Lord says throughout the New Testament, you go to the source through these means, and that. Um, you know, as we take a look at confessing our sins, there are specific places where Jesus says that forgiveness is going to be available for you to hold on to. So just confessing in a broad general sense um, without making use of the gift of forgiveness, it's, it's like the, the, the foolish virgins that didn't bother um, chasing after the oil and being ready before the, you know, the, the bridegroom returns. We, the bridegroom has given us the oil. 
He's given us that ally on that grace. He's given us his Holy Spirit. And he says, here's where I'm giving it to you. And to say, Lord, I know I've sinned, but I'm not going to go and go after that because it's not convenient or I don't particularly like it. Or, if you know, I, you know, I don't like how the preacher criticizes sins and I sometimes feel like he's talking directly to me. You know, I, no, I don't snoop around and follow people's Facebook accounts along the way to figure out what my sermon is going to be. Um, no, you preach the text. And the Holy Spirit does the rest. But then the other side is, is that by saying that, well, why, why, why come to church when I can go directly? That that often becomes a cop out because you know the next question becomes, so do you? Do you confess your sins? And usually the answer is no. Or if you do, you beat yourself up, and then you think that by you fixing yourself, that somehow you've undone the sins, and that you're good enough to get into heaven. When we're reminded throughout Scripture that. You know, no one of us is righteous, not even one. And, it, you know, we're not saved by our own works. We're saved by grace that comes from Christ. Eleison, which is grace, mercy, which comes from Christ through these gifts where he specifically says, here's where it's available for you, and here's where I give it to you, and it's baptism, the word, in the community of the church as we celebrate that, as we gather around the altar, in, with, and under the bread and wine. No one of the New Testament writers ever says that you can find it anywhere else. Um, and that becomes this interesting challenge for us in our world today. So confess your sins to one another. Confession as a group, but also confession of our own sins um, in, in that, that private context with the pastor becomes an important element of our spiritual lives. And then it goes on also, and here's the flip side of that. No, don't gossip about it. Don't use it to push people down, to judge others, because we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And don't worry about the speck in someone else's eye when you've got a log in yours. The point of confession is not to... Um, is not to, to find, you know, a basis upon which to go and criticize everybody else. The, the point of confession is to, to um, be honest with ourselves um, and, and to model that honesty and humility before the Lord and in front of one another so that um, we learn to pray for one another. And that becomes an extension of that working of the Holy Spirit in our lives as we work together as a body of Christ, not only to, you know, share our joys and sorrows, the way in which Paul writes about it, but then also as we bear one another's burdens, and this is the way that James, uses, you know, expresses that, so that you may be healed, okay? And that healing, well, yes, there's the physical side of things sometimes, but along the way as we wrestle and struggle and that inner dimension of our faith life, that duplicity, um, where we want to be Christian as opposed, uh, but really don't want to be part of it, uh, that don't work, um, where we want to be, um, where, where we want to do what is right, and we still wrestle and stumble, that's what Paul talks about, who will rescue me from this body of death, it's not my own response, but Christ Jesus, our Lord, so that as we deal with health in a holistic sense, which includes that duplicity, the double-mindedness which drives us nuts, which is the source of a great deal of inner stress and suffering and anxiety. Um, even that is something that Christ came and died on the cross for and gives us his Holy Spirit in order to heal us so that we lean less on our own abilities and lean more on Christ as he comes to us in and through the means of grace and in and through the community, the body of Christ, the church. Okay. So then he goes on. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Okay. So here's an interesting thing. Um, as we return back to, well, yes, the clergy of the church and request their prayers, there is an element of a promise attached here in James but more than referring to the clergy as the righteous ones, because I'll tell you very plainly, we stumble and sin just like anybody else. And putting us on a pedestal 
um, as somehow holier than everyone else um, becomes one of these these weird kinds of a things that that you know wreaks havoc within the life of our spiritual lives as a community. Um, pastors have a role, um, a God-given role to fulfill, and that's to be the the people that that um, speak that that forgiveness authoritatively, and that's by Christ's command, not not by something that we invent as a church. But as we listen to all of this, <clears throat> who is the righteous person? Ultimately, it is Christ, the righteous one, um, who becomes sin for us so that we can become the righteousness of God. So again, even that line there, um, connecting our faiths together with the community of the church, together with the office of the ministry through which Christ says he will be present to speak those words, um, is not a statement about pastors being the righteous one, um, the righteous person. It's Christ who is the righteous one, who continues to intercede or pray for the saints, as the New Testament writes. However, looking at this from an Old Testament prophet, okay, 17, Elijah was a man with nature like ours. So in other words, it's just like you and me, okay? And to show that God uses specific human beings just like you and me, broken, um, where Elijah wrestled with all kinds of worries and fears as well, but that God chooses, you know, to work through specific individuals for his purposes and pointing to the elders, the presbyters, as ones who have been charged with that responsibility to um, speak that word of forgiveness, that word of law and gospel with authority. Here he goes to the Old Testament example, Elijah, it says, Elijah was just like you and me, okay? Um, he prayed fervently that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it did not rain on the earth. It's because it was part of God's promise and God's plan. And then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. So that even Elijah the sinner, um, God used him in that way through his prayers. So rather than worrying about, you know, um, well, <laughs> I shouldn't say worrying about, rather than, than um, discounting the way in which God works through people and through means, and the way that Jesus has said he's going to, saying, yeah, I can do it on my own. You know, this verse is one of those reminders that, you know, just like the elders of the church who wrestle and struggle with the same things you and I do, um, don't discount the ministry that the Lord does through them. Because just remember Elijah, um, even the prayers of Elijah, who, you know, um, wrestled and struggled and sat in that cave saying, just kill me now, Lord, and all these sorts of things, because, you know, the whole world is against me. And then the Lord speaks to him out of the, out of the whirlwind and says, okay, I got a job for you. Um, even Elijah, because it was the Lord working in and through him, um, his, his prayer was powerful. So as we look at this whole passage, are you suffering? Turn your attention back to Christ. Are you cheerful? Turn your attention back to Christ. Are you sick? Turn your attention back to Christ. Look for the fuller healing rather than just the, the physical healing. And that those words are very important for us during COVID here as we're coming out of it. Um, hopefully, God willing, in, during in, you know throughout this this last wave, um, so that we don't remove ourselves from you know that that deeper um, desire of the Holy Spirit to to mend not just the outside of our bodies, okay, ultimately in the resurrection, yes, but even now, but also address the the brokenness of, of sin that the way it expresses itself in our in our impulses, in our worries, in our fears, in our tendency to be, um, um, you know, the jealous self-ambition that, that, that James wrote about last week. And so then he goes on in verse 19, My brothers, um, if any one of you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, and notice now here, and this is where this all connects together, the temptation to do things on our own and wandering away from the truth because of our suffering, our sickness, or our are, are um, being high on, on positive emotions and those sorts of things. Um, you know, if anyone wanders away, because that's how you wander away, 
that's how we wander away. We lean on ourselves. We forget Christ, which is something that our old, broken, sinful self loves to do. It says, if any one of you wanders from the truth, and the truth being Christ, and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover over a multitude of sins. Because as we hear that, and that's this marvelous, marvelous word for us to consider here and now, our role as members of the body of Christ is to be um, an extension of Christ's love, his grace, his comfort and forgiveness. Let the Holy Spirit do the work through the law to convict us of our sin. Absolutely, we don't, we don't step away from that. But it's not up to you or me to make sure that people feel guilty enough or bad enough about things, the way in which you know, even evangelical culture often works. Um, let the Holy Spirit do that work and then allow him to use you in order to become an extension of Christ as his hands, his feet, um, as we comfort one another as we bring people back, as we point to Christ, um, so that, yes, we retrain ourselves to sing his praises. Yes, we retrain ourselves to pray in the midst of suffering. And yes, even during physical illness and worries about physical threats, that we build on Christ, the cornerstone, as the one who cares for us right now in the midst of where we are at and so all right that's the james reading here for today and as we as we move on um yeah, tomorrow we'll take a look at the old testament reading it's a longer one this week from numbers but um you know may the lord continue to bless us and strengthen our faith through that same word and in his name we say 